Hello everyone, welcome to Healthcare Without Harm webinar series on pharmaceutical in the environment. My name is Adela Magyar, I am the Pharmaceuticals Policy Officer at Healthcare Without Harm Europe and I will be your moderator today when we talk about pharmaceutical pollution, the need for sustainable procurement. We have people from about 20 countries who registered to participate in Healthcare Without Harm's webinar on pharmaceuticals in the environment today. We are delighted to have all of you and I'm sure this will be worth your time today. Uh, for those of you that don't know Healthcare Without Harm, well, uh, we celebrated uh, our 20th anniversary in 2016. Healthcare Without Harm is an international coalition that works to transform the healthcare sector worldwide without compromising patient safety or care so that it becomes ecologically sustainable and a leading advocate for environmental health and justice. We have offices in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, in Europe, I am live from Brussels now, and in the US. We have strategic partners in Brazil, in Australia, in India, South Africa, and China. Our work is based on the assumption that every person should have the right to environmental health and access to health care. We need to ensure that people uh, live in a healthy environment and once they fall sick, they have access to proper health care and therapy. Healthcare Without Harm is the only Europe-wide campaign addressing the issue of pharmaceutical residues in the environment and their environmental impact which we suggestively call Safer Pharma. The aim of this campaign is to achieve new EU legislation that starts curbing pharmaceutical pollution, practically an EU law that will take action, which in turn will lead to measurable reduction of pharmaceuticals in the environment over time. In terms of our webinar today, just a few premises. In the right place, uh, as you know, pharmaceuticals save lives and uh, can prevent disease, but it is well known that pharmaceuticals in the environment represent a global pollution problem because over 631 different pharmaceutical agents or their metabolites have been detected in 71 countries on all continents. They are already damaging the environment and in the long term they could cause widespread damage to human health. At the EU level, uh, currently the European Commission is working to propose a strategic approach on pharmaceuticals in the environment, which is expected to be released at the beginning of 2018. Within our Safer Pharma campaign, uh, we have recently re released a video on the issue of pharmaceutical pollution. The video gives a general overview of the current situation of the presence of pharmaceutical residues in the environment and makes some recommendation on the roles of the general public, the health professionals and pharmaceutical industry in tackling pharmaceutical pollution. When the session closes, you will be redirected to a page on our website where you will be able to see this video. As you already know, our webinar today includes two speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Alex Darboxo. Uh, he is a professor in environmental sciences uh, at the University of York, the Environment Department. Uh, his research focuses on um, understanding the emerging and future ecological and health risks posed by chemical contaminants in the, nature, in, in the natural environment. He is a past member of the DESA Hazardous Substances Advisory Committee and the Veterinary Products Committee. He is a coordinator at the 3.5 million euro capacity project on pollution monitoring in cities and also an academic coordinator of the 3.5 million euro IPI project on intelligence-led assessment of pharmaceuticals in the environment and leads the York City Environment Observatory Initiative. He regularly advises national and international organizations on issues related to chemical impacts on the environment and has published extensively on the topic of chemicals risk in, in the environment. Our uh, second speaker today is Mrs. Lorea Conorado-Garcia, 
she is the Greening Health System Specialist at UNDP HIV uh, Health and Development Team situated in the Istanbul Regional Hub. Um, Lorea provides technical support for the Global Secretariat of the United Nations Interagency Task Team on Sustainable Procurement in the Health Sector, the SPHS. Uh, she has been working with the UNDP since um, 2015 and the HPHS initiative since early uh, 2016. She has assisted the UNDP as host of the HPHS initiative to develop sustainable procurement tools, guidelines and collaborations across the private and public sector and with experts from academic, scientific and cyber society communities. Uh, previously, she has worked in the private sector in a green investment bank, energy market exchange, and the um, alternative energy market analysis firm. She holds a master's degree in forest and nature management from the University of Copenhagen and a BSc and BS from the University of Michigan in material sciences and engineering and organizational studies. Uh, there will be time following the two presentations for questions and answers. All participants will be automatically muted during this session. At the time, uh, at any time during the webinar, if you encounter problems with your audio system or you have a question for a speaker, please uh, write it in the chat box as questions. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Healthcare Without Harm Europe's website over the coming weeks. So again, welcome to all of you and to our distinguished speakers. And with that, I'd like to give the word to our first speaker, Professor Alistair Boxtel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Adela for inviting me to present at this webinar. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a really interesting initiative. Um, what she asked me to do was to give us a 20 minute overview um, of the issues around pharmaceutical pollution and water quality. Um, so what I'm going to do is to, to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that we've been doing uh, around sort of pharmaceuticals in, in surface waters, uh, risks of pharmaceuticals in surface waters, uh, but I'll also draw on some of the other work that's being done around the world. So I think um, Many of you will, 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 will know um, and have um, perhaps bathroom cabinets like this that we use uh, a large range of pharmaceuticals uh, in our day to day lives. Um, but I think one thing that people don't really think about is what happens to these drugs uh, once they're used. So uh, when we take a drug, uh, we'll, we'll probably accumulate it into our bodies. Uh, we may metabolize it, uh, but then we'll excrete possibly the parent compound and the metabolites out into the environment. Uh, and typically what will happen in developing countries is that those materials then will go to a wastewater treatment sort of sewage works. So uh, this is just a slide of a, a sewer in London. Um, so this particular water here is probably probably got quite high concentrations of pharmaceuticals uh, in that water. Um, what will happen then is that that water will be transported to some form of treatment works. Uh, and this slide shows uh, one type of treatment work that we use in the UK. This is a trickling filter. Um, so what we have here is we have basically a bed of gravel. Uh, on that bed of gravel, uh, we have a biofilm. Uh, and the idea is that the biofilm degrades the organic material in the, in the sewage uh, and cleans it up. So you can then emit it to uh, surface waters. Uh, one of the issues, however, though, is that that biofilm uh, and some of these treatment technologies aren't always that effective at removing pharmaceuticals. So what that means is that as we use pharmaceuticals in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, they're emitted to the sewer system, they go to these wastewater treatment works, but ultimately what will happen is they will end up uh, in surface waters. Um, so we'll have emissions of pharmaceuticals uh, into surface waters such as this one. I think we also need to recognize that we use a lot of pharmaceuticals in the veterinary area. Um, so in the UK, for example, if you look at the statistics from the Veterinary Medicines Directorate, it's estimated that if we take antibiotics, for example, we're using about 290 tonnes a year uh, of antibiotics uh, in UK agriculture. Um, these can be excreted 
uh, when animals are on pasture, along with other substances such as parasiticides. Uh, but if you've got intensively reared animals, then we'll pro probably what will happen is the manure and slurry from those animals would be collected, uh, and then it'll be applied as a fertilizer to soils. And this will also provide a route of entry uh, of, of, sort of veterinary medicines uh, into the natural environment. And once in the soil environment, these materials could be trans transported around the agricultural system. They can possibly leach to groundwaters uh, and also run off uh, to surface waters. Probably the, sort of the, the final route of entry I want to talk about is, is manufacturing. So I think um, there's now a recognition uh, that you do get the potential uh, for emission of pharmaceuticals during manufacturing processes. Uh, probably the most, most well-known uh, study of this type was done by uh, Joachim Larsen's group um, about 10 years ago. And I think Joachim is actually listening in on this uh, webinar. Um, and what Joachim and his colleagues showed was that in areas uh, of India, you saw very, very high levels of, of pharmaceuticals uh, in, in sort of surface waters around manufacturing areas. And more recently, a number of studies have been done uh, in other areas of the world, including developing countries, also showing uh, that you get, get these emissions uh, in, in other countries of the world. Now, Adela mentioned um, the sort of data on the occurrence uh, of pharmaceuticals in the environment. And given what I've just said, I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious that pharmaceuticals are going to occur in the environment. Um, last year, uh, a very nice paper came out in Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry by Tim Alsterbeek. Uh, and what, what he tried to do was collate as much information as he can on the uh, studies that have been done around the world on the occurrence uh, of pharmaceuticals. And this, this slide just sort of summarizes some of that data. So what we have here is we have the colors indicating uh, which countries uh, have been monitored. Um, so about 70 countries actually have some monitoring data uh, on pharmaceuticals. And then the different colors indicate the, uh, the, sort of the ranges of pharmaceuticals uh, that have been seen in these, these sort of different countries. Um, so for example, um, if you look here, uh, you can see that um, in, in North America, we have sort of over 100 different active ingredients uh, being detected. And similarly, in areas of Europe, we have sort of over 100 pharmaceuticals being detected. In other regions of the world, so uh, perhaps in areas of Asia, the number of studies are much less, less uh, and many fewer pharmaceuticals uh, are being detected. In terms of the soil environment, uh, a lot less has been done. Uh, and agricultural systems, a lot less has been done. Uh, but the data that are coming out from these studies indicate that pharmaceuticals also occur in these environments. Uh, these are some of the classes that have been seen in studies in agricultural systems. So compounds like sulfonamide antibiotics, tetracycline antibiotics, fluoroquinolones, lincosamides, uh, carbamazepine, which is an anti-epileptic compound, uh, and triclosan, which is an antimicrobial, uh, but not really a pharmaceutical. Uh, these have all been detected uh, in both soils and associated water bodies uh, in, in agricultural systems. So I think it's fair to say, looking at the data that's available, that the occurrence of pharmaceuticals around the world uh, is quite widespread. Now, we've been doing quite a lot of work recently in York to sort of try and understand exposure uh, in the York system. Uh, this photo is, is our main river in York. This is the River Ouse. Uh, and what we've been doing is we've been doing quite a large monitoring campaign looking at a whole range of pharmaceuticals. Um, so this is the uh, study design. Uh, we have the map of the system here uh, in York. Here we have the city uh, it, it, where we're sort of in the dotted area. Uh, we have two rivers in the city. So we have the river, um, river Ouse here, which is our biggest river. And then we have the river Foss here, which is a smaller river. And then on those rivers, we have wastewater treatment work. So uh, this wastewater treatment work is an activated sludge treatment. And then this, this works here is a trickling filter treatment, a little like the photo uh, that I showed you earlier. And as I say, what we've been doing is we've been monitoring uh, a range of compounds in, in this system. Uh, and a few years ago, we did quite a, a big study where we looked at 88 pharmaceuticals across the network. And what we found, um, like many of the other studies being done around the world, um, is that you do detect the compounds. So of the 88 pharmaceuticals that we looked at, uh, we detected 36 of those. Uh, we see differences in terms of the rivers. So uh, on this slide here, uh, we have a heat map showing the 
concentration ranges of different active ingredients. So we have the active ingredients down here on the left. Uh, we have the colors indicating the concentrations. So if you had a red color, that means the concentration is quite low. Uh, if you have a pink color up here, it means the concentration is quite high. Uh, you can see that at the top here, um, these are the highest concentrations we see. We see those in the FOSS, which is a low flow river. It has the trickling filter input. We see very high concentrations of metformin, which is a type 2 diabetes drug. And this data have just come out uh, in, in a journal, so they've just been published in Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, and they're beginning to give us an insight into the behaviour of these compounds in the York River system. So obviously the presence of these compounds in the environment then raises questions about, you know, are they doing anything to the environment? Um, and over the years, uh, the research community have raised a number of concerns about the potential occurrence and effects of pharmaceuticals in the natural environment and in surface waters. And this concern really has been driven by the fact that these, these compounds are designed to be biologically active. So in us, they're designed to inter interact with a, a receptor or a pathway. Uh, and the issue is, is that many of these receptors and pathways are conserved in organisms and in natural environment. So if we have this entry of pharmaceuticals and occurrence of pharmaceuticals in the environment, if they're taken up by organisms and those organisms have some type of receptor that's able to respond to the, the pharmaceutical, then there's a possibility that you'll get effects. And there's been a number of studies done over the years looking at some of these effects um, and also some of the side effects. And probably the best known of those is the story uh, of the diclofenac and vultures. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of this, but if, if not, this is very, a very quick overview uh, of, of, of that issue. Um, so what happened in certain areas of India and Pakistan um, is over a period of about 20 years, there was a big decline in the, in the populations of a number of vulture species. Uh, at the time, a lot of forensic work was done to try and find out what was causing that decline. Uh, and the conclusion at the end was that it was down to exposure uh, to, a, to a pharmaceutical, uh, a compound called diclofenac, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And in this, in this particular instance, what was happening was the drug was being used uh, for veterinary purposes. So it was being used to treat cattle. Uh, the vultures were coming in. They were predating on the carcasses of dead cattle. They were getting a dose of the diclofenac. And because they were particularly sensitive to this molecule, over time it resulted uh, in a drastic decline in the population. And it's thought that that had big impacts uh, in terms of the wider environment. So this was an interesting study that came out in 2009, thinking about the potential effects of the diclofenac uh, on human health, the indirect effects through the vulture decline. Uh, and what this study was saying is that if we have the decline in vulture population resulting from the treatment of diclofenac, um, what will, will happen is you get an increase in the feral dog population, which is taking over from the vultures in the eco ecosystem. Um, that then leads to an increase in dog bites of humans. Uh, in the area, uh, there's quite a high incidence of rabies, so that will then will result in an increase in uh, the incidence of rabies. And they did some fairly simple calculations to estimate what that would mean in terms of human health. Uh, and they estimated that over the period where you had this decline in the number of vultures, that could probably have related to about 45,000 extra human deaths. Now, obviously, that's quite extreme. Um, and uh, probably uh, um, 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 very unlikely to happen uh, in the European system. Um, so what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides is, is sort of studies that are perhaps more relevant to uh, what, what, what the sort of environments that I'm used to uh, in Europe. And there's a number of studies sort of looking at sort of other effects in the environment that could be occurring uh, in sort of Europe uh, and North America. Um, this interesting study came out in, in 2013. Um, so this was a study by Thomas uh, Broden uh, from Sweden. Um, and what he and his team did was look at um, effects uh, of a benzodiazepine molecule, a molecule called oxazepam, uh, which is used for treating uh, anxiety and insomnia. Uh, and what they did was look at the effect of exposure uh, to oxazepam on fish behavior, and they worked with perch. Uh, and, and from those studies, what they showed was that in the laboratory, at a near environmentally relevant concentration, uh, what you found is that the fish that were exposed to uh, the oxazepam, they became uh, more active, they became more bold, uh, 
and that resulted uh, in a reduction in feeding, uh, and also it made the fish less social. So what we're seeing in these types of studies, and there's studies uh, like this that have been done on other molecules, is that you are getting, or seem to be getting, the potential for behavioral effects on aquatic organisms. We've done work uh, where we try to take some of this data uh, and ask the question, well, does it mean anything uh, in terms of risk to the environment? What's the level of risk to the environment? Um, so what we've been doing is we've been modeling uh, exposure of UK river systems to a whole range of pharmaceuticals. We've been extracting data from the literature, so literature like the Broden paper, uh, on reported effects in the laboratory. And then we've been comparing the concentrations that we predict in the environment to concentrations that are seen uh, to affect organisms in the laboratory. Um, these are some of the findings that we get from that type of analysis. So for ibuprofen, for example, um, what we find is if we model um, at over 3,000 river reaches in the UK, 45% of those river reaches have levels of ibuprofen where in the laboratory um, effects of fish on fish hatching have been reported. Uh, if we take diclofenac, um, about 4.5% of those river reaches have levels of diclofenac uh, where effects on fish histology have been reported in the laboratory. So this indicates that these molecules might need uh, further scrutiny. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, that these impacts are really happening in the environment, but I think it's an alert that these are some things that we should be looking at and trying to investigate a little bit more fully. We've been extending recently this work to other organisms, so we've been thinking about food chain impacts. Um, so a few years ago, I had a PhD student, Tom Bean, who started thinking about what the potential effects of pharmaceuticals in the environment would be on birds. Um, so the idea here is that you get the release of the environment, uh, the pharmaceutical into the environment, you get an, ink, uh, an uptake potentially of that pharmaceutical into, an, into a food item, so that could be a worm on a, on a treatment works, it could be a fish, and then you have birds coming in, ac accumulating these food items and being exposed to the, uh, to the pharmaceuticals. Uh, Tom did work on um, an antidepressant, so he worked with an antidepressant called fluoxetine. Uh, and in his studies, what he did was he spiked worms with fluoxetine at the types of levels that we'd expect in a trickling filter treatment works. He fed those to the birds for a period of about six months and did a lot of work to try and see whether that exposure had any effect on the behavior of the birds. So a similar type of study to the work of Brodin, but now beginning to look at impacts on bird species. And what he found actually was that for, for the things that we expected would be affected weren't really affected. Um, but we did see evidence that exposure to the flux, fluoxetine could affect the feeding behavior of the bird. Um, so this is something that we think needs a little bit more investigation. We're not saying it's definitely happening, but again, it's an alert that these types of things could be happening uh, in the real world. Moving to antibiotics. Um, there's a, a, a lot of data in the literature now showing that antibiotics are particularly toxic to uh, algae and blue-green algae. Um, we've been looking at uh, risks of antibiotics in the veterinary systems. So um, I had a, a PhD student, Jia Ha Gu, who sort of looked at um, effects of mixtures of antibiotics on algal species. And then he did modeling across the European landscape to look at what the level of risk might be across that landscape. And from that work, work we began to conclude that actually concentrations that we see of these antibiotics in the environment are hundreds of times higher than those that are known to affect algae uh, in the laboratory. So if these equate to effects in the real environment, what that could mean is that exposure to the antibiotics could be having an impact on primary production uh, in some agricultural systems. There's also, I think, increasing recognition that exposure to antibiotics uh, in the natural environment and in water, in soils, could be contributing to the issue of anti antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and I think this is a hot topic at the moment uh, and an area where there's a lot of research going on. Um, and finally, the final example I want to move talk about is, is again, it's a veterinary medicine. Um, so this is moving to the parasiticides. Um, we've been doing a lot over the years on veterinary medicines and risks of veterinary medicines. Um, and the parasiticides in particular seem to be particularly potent to organisms in the environment. Uh, and using some studies that we did a few years ago, where we looked at the runoff of parasiticides from farmyard surfaces. So we did monitoring studies where cows were treated with the parasiticide. Um, 
on the farmyard and we then had instruments monitoring the runoff water from the farmyard into streams and what we saw in those studies is the levels of the parasiticides we see in the in the runoff water were over 12,000 times higher than concentrations that have been shown to affect the reproduction of invertebrates in the environment and again this indicates that this if this is happening in reality uh, it could be possible that some of these molecules are having big impacts on the ecology of ecosystems uh, and, and on invertebrate populations uh, in particular. So I think taken together, what this is all showing us is that for many of the compounds we're looking at, actually the risks are quite low. But there's probably a handful of compounds and perhaps a handful of scenarios where risks could be occurring. And that then raises the question, well, if, if we get risks of these molecules, they're very important to human health, they're very important to animal health, how can we manage those risks? Um, and one thing that we're beginning to sort of to in a bit more detail is, is different ways in which we can begin to manage and mitigate the risks of pharmaceuticals uh, in both soil and aquatic environments. Uh, these are some of the ideas that have been put forward. So uh, we could think about more targeted and environmentally friendly pharmacology. We could think of ways in which we can change the usage behavior of pharmaceuticals. So perhaps move from more hazardous pharmaceuticals to less hazardous pharmaceuticals. We could improve wastewater treatment processes. We could perhaps begin to focus um, treatments on hospital emissions to manage those. We could introduce take-back schemes. We could increase education so that people are aware of these take-back schemes. And we could begin to look at things like in-situ treatment systems to treat things uh, at the pharmacy scale or at the clinic scale. Um, these are some of the different approaches um, that have been talked about and some of them that we're looking at. So uh, here we have uh, a Swedish system, which is sort of an eco-labeling system for pharmaceuticals, which gives a score to a pharmaceutical active ingredient based on its environmental hazard and risk properties. Um, here we have the pharma filter system, uh, which is a really neat system that's been introduced in, the universe, uh, in, the, in a hospital in Delft. Uh, and what this system does is it's a, sort of a, it's a hospital based wastewater and waste management system that treats pharmaceuticals and other outputs from a hospital at the hospital and it therefore prevents the entry of these materials into the sewage network. We could think about changing uh, the way that we, we develop and, and use drugs. So uh, this is a, a picture of a nanomedicine. As we move to nanotechnology, that means that we could perhaps use much less active ingredient than we do at the moment. We could make the treatment much, much more targeted. We could perhaps use personalized medicine more. And we could begin to consider in situ treatments. So this treatment in the middle here, this is the PyroPure system that we've been working with, which is, is aimed to be used in hospitals and clinics. And the idea is that as the hospital and the clinic or the pharmacist produces waste or gets waste returned by the customer, they can put it into the system on site and that can result in more than 99% destruction of the pharmaceutical. And we could then take that idea to the home. So this is, an, this is a hazardous waste toilet that could perhaps be used for very hazardous pharmaceuticals. So that if someone perhaps has been treated with a particularly hazardous substance, they could take this toilet home with them and they could treat the waste from that individual uh, in situ. And finally, we could begin to uh, update some of the existing treatment systems that we have, the sort of types of treatment works that I talked about later earlier. The trouble with that is it's very expensive. And I think probably what we need is a completely integrated approach where we begin to use a number of these different approaches in tandem. So I'll begin to uh, wrap up there. So just to summarize, um, there are major concerns over pharmaceuticals in the environment from the research community uh, and also from the public. Um, the work we're showing is that there are pharmaceuticals perhaps that may be a concern in the environment. We do more, need more work to begin to understand whether they really pose a risk in reality or not. Uh, we're beginning to consider now the impacts on wildlife, um, and I think this is an area, again, that needs more research. But I think on the positive side, we do have a range of management options available, uh, and probably what we need to start doing is looking at how that can be used in an integrated way to begin to minimize environmental exposure to pharmaceuticals. Um, but there are still many open questions, uh, and I think we have a lot of work to do. So at that point, I will stop, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Alistair. Um, and now I will give the word to Mrs. Lorea Coronado-Garcia. 
Thank you, Adela. Thank you, Adela, for the introduction earlier. Um, as Adela mentioned, my work at UMDP and in support of the Sustainable Procurement in the Health Sector Initiative looks at how to integrate sustainable procurement in the health sector into UNDP programs and practices, and which of those lessons and tools can be shared across the UN and its network. I'm happy to share more about how our work at UNDP leverages pharmaceutical and broader health sector um, procurement to support the uptake of sustainable practices. UNDP operates in some 170 countries with an aim to empower people to live resilient lives. Achieving such a goal requires careful attention to health issues and health systems. This can include addressing major infectious diseases, non-communicable diseases, and other determinants of health. One pillar of our health team's work is the important connection between health and environment, so in other words, um, safeguarding sanitary health. The challenge in this, however, is that, very, um, that the very programs aimed at improving human health leave large environmental footprints. This can include, for example, the purchase of pharmaceuticals, such as antiretrovirals to help fight HIV and AIDS, or antibiotics to help fight TB or tuberculosis. These are often purchased in one continent, produced in another, uh, used in a third continent, and can also run the risk of being disposed of incorrectly, as Alistair has mentioned. To address the global environmental footprint of such procurement activities, which occur across various different UN agencies, the Sustainable Procurement in the Health Sector Initiative was started. The SPHS initiative, for short, um, aims to leverage UN agencies and health funding institutions' normative, operational, and financial role in the health sector to introduce sustainable practices in the health sector across its global network. Um, presented in an earlier Healthcare Without Harm webinar and mentioned by Alistair, um, was a study on how pharmaceuticals in the environment occur across all UN regions. Um, I think we can all appreciate this is, is quite serious. And um, as I alluded to earlier, one of the great challenges of a global organization is its global footprint. In our efforts to promote health in one region, um, we of course can't um, do so um, with any negative health impact on, um, in other regions. The one example that has received um, attention recently, um, as Alistair mentioned, is in India. And India is fast emerging. Um, part of this reason is because India is fast emerging as an outsourcing destination for global pharmaceutical majors, um, which are looking at reducing manufacturing and drug development costs. However, there have also been studies and reports on challenges these manufacturers are having in keeping their local environment clean and free of chemicals, notably of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, this can, uh, of course, speed up the development of superbugs um, and, and, um, and basically goes because from being a, a local concern of contamination to a, a global concern. And on the other end of the supply chain, um, we have found that there are health programs um, that the UN uh, administers um, that uh, may not actually, at the location of the program, have the necessary systems to dispose of the medical waste or deal with the influx of pharmaceuticals into their wastewater. These examples um, have to do with global production and global consumption practices. That means the solution has to address both uh, responsible production and consumption. This is also the Sustainable Development Goal 12. You can see here in uh, this representative graphic of the success stories featured on our platform, which I will introduce later, um, that you can see the concentration of dots near the SDGs um, or the Sustainable Development Goals that we work with the most. Um, these are SDG 3, Good Health and Well-Being, SDG 12, 
responsible consumption and production, SDG 17, and partnerships for the goal. Of our focus areas um, at, in the SPHS, um, largely relevant to today's webinar are medical products, waste management, and water. One way we have focused um, our efforts on improving sustainable procurement is through reinforcing possibilities for sustainable production. Uh, this requires supplier engagement. In November, SPHS published its engagement strategy to work in collaboration with suppliers and manufacturers to introduce procurement in the global health sector. The publication helped identify and prioritize different products and product categories develop a plan for engaging our supply chain, and laid out a milestone for the strategy. UNDP also has partnered with Healthcare Without Harm on a research collaboration to develop a list of some 200 chemicals for substitution in UNDP and interested SPHS members procured health commodities. The, this list of green procurement criteria also provides recommendations on how to evaluate and select the healthcare products based on this criteria. The list of key products to analyze was developed based on procurement volume and environmental impact. It includes ingredients often used in pharmaceuticals used to treat tuberculosis and HIV and AIDS. The list has been finalized and will be published very soon. Um, ultimately, we will be engaging with suppliers and manufacturers of pharmaceuticals and medical devices to stimulate the development of greener products um, and manufacturing products processes. Uh, UNDP has also developed a tool um, and published a guide that supports procurement offices to check for compliance with five international environmental conventions on chemicals. Um, these are the Basel Convention on um, the Transboundary Movements of Hazardous Waste, Rotterdam Convention um, on the Prior Informed Consent Procedure for Certain Hazardous Chemicals in International Trade, the Vienna Convention um, for Protection of the Ozone Layer, Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, Minamata Convention on Mercury. The tool runs on Excel and produces an automated dashboard, including a checklist on what to measure to check for compliance, indicators for degree of compliance, and guidance on what to look for in products. It generates a report dashboard with a combination of graphics and tables to make the results more understandable. This, the aim of this is to allow procurement units not only to monitor the compliance with environmental conventions, but also to identify key products where further action um, will be required and to have a to have greener procurement. Our environmental questionnaire for suppliers and manufacturer um, is will be um, published very soon and was based on international standards, uh, new and, and global compact uh, principles, global reporting indicators, and um, we've also incorporated um, input from um, other existing questionnaires um, produced by international organizations. Um, as a second phase of the questionnaire development, um, we will actually be taking it online um, and developing an environmental online assessment tool. This tool um, will be used to create environmental profiles of suppliers. As a result, every supplier will be evaluated based on the, uh, their success in energy, chemicals, um, hazardous substances, waste, packaging, environmental sustainability practices, global um, or greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, water and wastewater management. The tool is supposed to ease the process of introducing sustainable procurement criteria at the UN tender processes. Through the collection of relevant data on suppliers' environmental practices, it will not only um, serve as a baseline, but also define a set of realistic environmental criteria to be included in upcoming tenders. This database will become a powerful tool um, to identify best practices as well as areas where support and capacity building for suppliers is necessary. 
It also helps signal to manufacturers and suppliers that um, environmental performance and um, profiles are increasingly important to us. Um, and this tool is currently under development, but um, for any of the listeners, if, if you'd be interested in testing, we, we would welcome that, absolutely. So that was a bit of what we're doing um, on the production side, um, working with um, suppliers and manufacturers. But as I mentioned earlier, um, responsible consumption is also important for us. Um, so basically UNDP um, in, has several projects. Um, one that I'd like to highlight is um, that it has supported um, the Medical Stores Limited um, Agency in Zambia um, to store and distribute pharmaceutical health products across the country. Um, and, this, and also to install um, power, uh, solar power systems. The agency was faced um, with a consistent energy distress that affected the, re the refrigeration of medicines and vaccines. Another example um, from our SPHS network um, is a project that the Gavi um, Vaccine Alliance has um, supported, and they have helped countries modernize their cold chain systems. The cold chain is a, very, is a key part of the immunization supply chain um, because it keeps the temperature sensitive immunization product safe and potent. Um, and hard to reach communities often have um, poor or no access to electricity. And this can ultimately reduce the ability to safely store um, health supplies and vaccines. However, effective vaccination can in turn help reduce occurrence of illness um, which also in turn can reduce misdiagnosis, misuse of antibiotics, and other medicines. Um, and then this, of course, ultimately um, means that it can also reduce um, the consumption of pharmaceuticals and reduce the likelihood of their finding the way into the environment. In another project, UNDP and Global Fund set out to assess the possible environmental impact of Global Fund grants caused by waste created through health projects. Um, country assessments on healthcare waste were carried out um, in various countries, including in Bosnia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and uh, Zimbabwe. Um, it was found that the implementation of the Global Fund health projects um, will create um, non-hazardous waste, but also dozens of toxic, uh, infectious, or other kinds of hazardous waste types. This could include the waste of um, expired pharmaceuticals, um, contaminated packaging materials, needles, syringes, um, and other pathogens. Analysis of waste management was concluded, of course, to be important. Uh, depending on the country-specific context, different options may exist in the disposal and treatment of pharmaceutical waste generated by the project. And these capacities um, at the country level or at the local level um, are important to take into consideration in administering the, the, the program. For example, um, Hazardous, uh, hazardous waste, such as pharmaceutical waste or chemical waste, um, should be outlined how it will be segregated, collected, transported, stored, and disposed. Um, and as pharmaceutical ingredients, or uh, as medicines can include various pharmaceutical ingredients, um, a separate hazard assessment should also be carried out for each pharmaceutical product. In the assessments, um, pharmaceutical waste was defined as um, pharmaceuticals that are expired or no longer needed, items contained by, um, contaminated by or containing uh, pharmaceuticals. This includes expired, um, unused, unwanted, spilled, and contaminated pharmaceutical products, um, medicines, and vaccines. It also includes all um, bottles, boxes, and vials used to contain pharmaceuticals which are no longer re required. Um, and this, of course, is, 
is a huge burden um, at the at the local level where these programs are being administered. And so this is part of the reason why proper storage and use of pharmaceuticals um, is also relevant to um, sustainable procurement and consumption. Here you can see in this graphic that as soon as a product is procured, its final disposal should be managed as there are a number of pathways that the pharmaceutical can, um, can take into the environment. Also, as part of the work, um, a healthcare waste management toolkit package um, for global fund practitioners, but um, applicable um, more broadly also for policymakers, um, has been developed. The toolkit is intended to help reduce risk from the generation disposal of healthcare waste, especially in the disposal of unwanted and unused pharmaceuticals. Um, part C should be um, published in the coming months as well. Um, and, and to take into account these, um, these lessons learned um, and others um, in related projects in the health sector, um, we've developed um, a basically training, a two-day two training um, with UN Environment um, to, to share these, these lessons and these tools and to empower um, procurement um, officers in, in implementing these changes and also engage, helping us to engage um, their contacts um, as a supplier manufacturing base. Because as we see it, um, the supply chain really is now the new frontier for sustainable operations and programming. And to also make um, also to make these lessons more um, broadly available, um, we've developed this um, online platform that I mentioned earlier, which we consider as our um, knowledge hub. It's um, at www.savinglivesustainably.org. Um, you can find many of the things I mentioned early, uh, throughout um, this webinar, but uh, you can also do your own searches um, and filter based on areas such as uh, medical products, waste, or, or water. And it's constantly being updated with uh, new features and new projects. Um, so we also um, open this hub to the broader community to share um, success stories, so please feel free to contribute yours as well. Thank you very much for your attention, and with that, I'll pass it back to Adela. Thank you very much, Lorea, for uh, this interesting presentation. We have uh, quite a lot of questions from our attendees, so uh, we might be a bit uh, around 10 minutes over time, but uh, I ask you all to stay with us because uh, uh, I will uh, ask our speakers all your questions so uh, uh, you can find out more about, uh, about uh, their work. So I will start uh, with a question for um, Professor Alistair Boxo. Actually, it's two related questions. Uh, do you think that the global perspective that uh, you are describing is relevant to national or even more local organizations? And has your da data on the drugs found in the York River system lead to any action by the local authorities? Um, I'll start with the second one first. So. Um, that data have just have just been published. Um, what what we're planning to do actually. So what we haven't done yet is actually put that data in a risk perspective. So um, at the moment it's just uh, monitored concentrations. Um, my guess is that for most of those compounds, the concentrations will be a lot lower uh, than concentrations that could be impacting the environment. So in terms of um, you know, the need for uh, for local uh, regulators to act on it, um, I, I'm not sure yet whether they would need to do that or not. Um, we do, however, work very closely with the local water company, so uh, 
uh, Yorkshire Water is our local water company, uh, and they are involved in some of the monitoring work that, that we've done. Um, in terms of the, the question about sort of moving from the global uh, scale to the local scale, um, I, th I think, yes, we, we probably do need to sort of start working more at the local scale um, and actually, you know, working within communities in an integrated way uh, to sort of begin to sort of understand uh, the issues and also uh, sort of introduce mitigation approaches uh, for controlling exposure. You now a question for Lorea. What are the challenges that you see from UNDP when working with healthcare professionals in terms of procurement of pharmaceuticals? Um, well, that's interesting. Um, I think our work directly connects more often with um, procurement offices, um, and I think. Um, the challenge there sometimes is um, empowering the procurement officers to to feel that their um, that their role is is strategic and broader, um, and and to give them the tools that they need to continue to do their job efficiently, but also um, be able to incorporate more information because as we in, introduce. Um, these kind of sustainability baselines or sustainability initiatives, um, that means that procurement officers are trying to um, to deal with more information, processing of more information. Um, so, th so that's probably um, one of the challenges that, that we find with dealing with the procurement officers. Uh, thank you, Lorea. Now a question for the Alistair. Um, Pertaining to the study you presented on the effect of diclofenac and indirect effect on humans, you said that the death would be unlikely to happen in Europe. Why is that? And where would you say that is more likely to occur? And again, for what reasons? Yeah, okay. So, um, so the way that that, uh, that prediction worked um, was it was looking at the, the, the pathway where uh, the, the, the decline in the vulture population led to an increase in the feral dog population, which then led to an increase in dog bites and then rabies. Um, and I think, I mean, in, in so certainly uh, Europe, um, so North America, uh, the you know that that sort of pathway I think is is less likely because I don't think uh, rabies is as endemic uh, as, as sort of that particular region. Now it could be that sort of it's an issue in other other regions of the world, um, and I think that that's something uh, that, that probably would, 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 could be looked at. But I think certainly in terms of Europe, I, I don't think that particular pathway would be that relevant. And I don't think um, the drug is being used uh, in that way in Europe. I think there's some use in Spain, but it's not to the same extent as it was used in India and Pakistan. I'll start another question uh, on diclofenac. What was at risk is not use of diclofenac in livestock, but appropriate disposal of dead animals, such open field disposal is prohibited in Europe? Yeah, I didn't, did not, didn't get that question, sorry. Uh, what was at risk if not use of diclofenac in livestock, but appropriate disposal of dead animals, such open field disposal is prohibited in Europe? What what was at risk? The, I, I, the risk is not using diclofenac in livestock. I think something like this. Oh, so the risk the risk of not using uh, yeah. diclofenac. Well, I think I think what's happened in that region is. Um, uh, They've, they've um, identified alternative treatments that do do the same job as diclofenac did. Um, so I think it's a molecule called meloxicam uh, is now used or has been proposed for use in the cattle to take over from the from the uh, um, from the diclofenac, and that's a lot less toxic to the vultures, so it doesn't have the same side effect. Um, in terms of you know the carcasses, I think I mean I think that's down to the practices in those countries. Um, and, and that's partly why, why the problem happened. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we move to Lorea. Have you been in conversation with the pharmaceutical industry to address pollution during production of pharmaceuticals you procure? Um, well, one project that we are, are looking to develop with Siwi, um, which is the Swedish International Water Institute, um, is to develop a program to further engage um, manufacturers of pharmaceuticals. Um, and this is definitely going to be a learning project where we see, um, based off Stevie's previous project, um, how to engage with the manufacturers and then hopefully take those learnings to the broader um, pharmaceutical sector. And how will the UNDP use the information collected from the questionnaires and self-assessment tools? Thanks. Um, well, basically what we aim to do from these questionnaires is to understand what are the, the current practices of our um, supplier base, um, both on, on the manufacturing level and also on, on the distribution level. So we want to understand um, what is currently happening and that way we can introduce um, certain standards that are easily achievable and then gradually increase those standards um, uh, to, to promote sustainability. Basically, we don't want to start with, um, with, with standards that are too high um, because we need to be, uh, consider inclusivity of our supplier base um, and, and we need to also uh, protect smaller um, suppliers, for example, um, from not being able to compete to compete with um, for, with larger suppliers. Okay, thank you. We go again to Alistair now. As part of the discussion that is taking place these days during the Ocean Conference in New York, which will be your recommendations for preventing pharmaceutical pollution in both rivers and oceans in regard to the results of the studies on fishes? Um. So my recommendation is I think we need to um, sort of use a sort of fairly integrated approach to sort of um, minimizing pharmaceutical emissions. Um, I, don't, I don't think the, you know, the solution of upgrading uh, every wastewater treatment works is a sensible one. Um, because it, you know, it's, it costs so much to do. In the, in the UK, there was a paper a few years ago that estimated that it was going to be 28 billion euros over a 10-year period. Um, I think you know, we should be a lot more clever uh, and integrated. So that's everything from you know, educating the public about take-back schemes if they exist. So they exist in the UK, but no one knows about them. Uh, beginning to look at some of these more clever approaches. Um, so the, the example of the pharma filter uh, hospital that I, I, I showed, I think is, is really, really, sort of really clever and really quite exciting. Um, and you know, if, if specialist hospitals could start using those types of technologies, then that could help to sort of reduce the inputs of some of the more hazardous substances to the environment. Um, and then this idea of some of the in situ uh, approaches. So I, I showed the of the Parapure system, as I say, that's something that we've worked on. And the idea with that is it sits in the, the pharmacist um, and it, it starts to, you know, sort of um, when, when you take your medicines back, it destroys them in situ. Um, so you have no problems in terms of uh, transport to incinerators. You don't have the issues of incineration. You don't have the other environmental costs uh, of some of these other treatment approaches. Um, so I just think we need to be a little bit more clever uh, and integrated, and I don't think we should just you know, just upgrade every sewage treatment works. Uh, I have also for you two more similar questions. Uh, what are some of the improvements pharmaceutical companies have undertaken to be more environmentally friendly? What is your opinion essential in conversion to environmental friendly pharmacology? And what do you see the role of compliance in becoming more environmental friendly ph pharmacology? Okay, so I think there were three questions there. So the, yeah. the, the, fir the first one was um, about this of, uh, the companies. Um, I think the, the companies are actually getting very good uh, in terms of um, recognizing the importance of, uh, of um, 
the, the sort of risks of pharmaceuticals in the environment. Um, so I think at the start, you, when you introduced me, you mentioned that I'm academic coordinator uh, of the IPI project. Um, and this is a, a 10.3 million euro project where the industry and research organizations are working together to develop new approaches to identify those pharmaceuticals that are likely to pose the greatest risk to the environment. And then that will give the industry the tools to you know, identify which compounds they should perhaps be testing and understanding more about, and possibly in the long term, which, which, uh, which compounds perhaps they, you know, they should be beginning to replace with other compounds. Um, the second question in terms of, uh, I guess, of developing gr benign by design uh, drugs. Um, I'm a little bit more skeptical with that one. Um, when you talk to uh, the industry, I think the you know, the process that drugs have to go through to be developed, um, I think that makes the the, sort of the idea of developing benign by design drugs not that practical. Um, there might be instances where you have um, certain therapeutic uh, classes where perhaps it could could work. So if, for example, it were possible to develop a, a more environmentally friendly uh, a synthetic estrogen, then that could be a winner for a company. But I don't, I don't think you know, that, that, that's a particularly practical solution um, for all drugs. But what I do think um, offers a lot of potential is this, this move to um, some of the newer medical technologies. So I think uh, I mentioned nanotechnology. Um, there's talk now of nanomedicines uh, and the use of nanomedicines with will probably result in uh, medicines being better targeted at the site of action. Um, so therefore, you perhaps use less of the active ingredient. So what we're going to excrete into the environment is less. And I also think personalized med medicine uh, offers a lot of potential. So rather than give everyone um, a set dose of a molecule, which is designed to treat the whole of the population, if we can sort of begin to give a dose that's designed for the individual, that again will begin to reduce uh, of emissions to the environment, and it will also provide benefits in terms of the health of individuals. So I think, I think you know, benign by design, I'm skeptical about, but I think there's some other technologies in the future that could be quite useful uh, in terms of beginning to reduce emissions. Now I can't remember your third third question. Uh, how do you see the role of compliance in becoming more environmental friendly pharmacology? What what what's meant by that? Do you know? Uh, no, that that was the uh, question we received. Yeah. If the person can give us more details, maybe we or, can. Or perhaps drop me an email. Yeah, or uh, the person can send you an email yeah. to you. That will be perfect. Okay, we move to Lorea. We keep receiving lots of questions. How can companies involved in healthcare compliance monitoring? Uh, work together with UNDP on healthcare procurement compliance. So the, the question was, how can companies working on healthcare compliance um, work with us? Is that right? Yeah, how, how they can, I think the question refers to how they can collaborate with us, with, yeah. the, with the UNDP. Um, well, the SPHS network really includes about 4,000 um, technical experts um, from academia, um, from the public and private sector, um, and so so we're we are happy to work together um, with with organizations that are, are doing work that's that's similar to ours. Um, and so I think the best way is just to to drop us a, an email and and to um, to speak with us so that we can um, kind of do a, a comparison of of the work we're we're planning in the next uh, year. And then, and then see what kind of um, either uh, projects we can develop together, um, or at least um, programming that we can incorporate together. And another question also for Lorea: Reducing consumption of pharmaceuticals will negatively affect profitably and pharmaceutical companies. Uh, understandably, have been driving increased consumption. It has been suggested that to drive uh, research and development in antimicrobials that can stay on the shelf as antimicrobials of a last resort, a different funding model is required. Do you think that this is applicable more widely, such as for other types of pharmaceuticals, and how could it be instigated? 
And so the question I think was um, whether looking at other options besides pharmaceuticals um, would help um, to to change the consumption patterns. Is that how you understood the question? Or uh, would change? I don't know the yeah also the consumption pattern, but also make maybe make a better. Uh, a better business case for the industry. Okay. Um, well, I can speak more broadly to the health sector. Um, and SPHS has um, together a spending um, power of about five billion a year. Um, so we definitely do look to use um, that kind of market influence to 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 have the initiatives that we're developing uh, be taken seriously. Um, and and we recognize that the UN system has um, a certain uh, weight and reach, and and so that's um, some of the I guess ways that we're looking to to work with the pharmaceutical industry to to change some of its practices. Um, I think in terms of policies on um, the use of pharmaceuticals in programming. Um, that's probably beyond the, the scope of, um, of UNDP and our work um, and tends to probably lie more with WHO recommendations and um, how, the, how they view um, global health um, policy um, things of initiatives. Okay, thank you, Lorea. Um, our attendee just uh, clarified his question for Alistair. So uh, the compliance is a priority for a lot of companies. So how would you see their role in the transformation to environmental friendly pharmacology so, or pharmaceuticals? Yeah. About, I, I, I guess it links to what I was saying more in terms of the the technology development, so you know, developing um, better ways to uh, you know minimise the amount amount of active ingredients we used. So perhaps better targeting free things like nanotechnology um, and the use of personalised medicine. Um, and I, I could see that you know as a way of beginning to reduce um, you know what what we excrete as individuals out into the natural environment. Um, I think, in terms of the, you know, the pharmacology and perhaps some of the prescribing practices as well as the doctors, uh, that's that's probably the way to do it. And uh, we have an attendee that has a couple of questions regarding your mitigation suggestions. Uh, how could procurement influence environmental risk management? Are there particular pharmaceuticals or groups of compounds where procurement could have a particularly large effect for reducing the environmental risk? Yeah, I guess that's going to be quite compound specific um, and, and really depend on where the origin of the compound uh, is. Um, so I, I imagine, it, you know, if, if you have, have um, Active ingredients and in products that are sourced from the types of situation that, that I that I showed in the diagram about the manufacturing site, um, the, 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 work, the work that Joachim Larson did. You know, there, there may be ways of like sort of integrating that type of information um, into deciding you know, whether whether you should be you know, using that particular material or not. Um, not sure how you would do it, but but uh, I, I guess that's the sort of thing that you'd need to do. Um, and perhaps be you know, sourcing sourcing the, the active ingredient either from another source or uh, an alternative that comes from a, a source that's having less of an environmental impact. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the same attendee asks if you says that you recommended the pharma filter, but not a general upgrade of SCP. Have you done the cost benefit calculation behind that? Are not separate treatment at hospitals who contribute with a minor fraction of the drugs used a costly solution that 
can only reduce a minor fraction anyway? Um, we've not done the costs cost analysis or the cost benefit analysis, uh, but my 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 feeling is that it's probably more effective to try and manage uh, manage exposure up, as far upstream as you can. Uh, and I, my my feeling is that 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 will actually be more cost effective um, than you know. So if, if you're targeting um, so if you've got a town, for example, where you've got a hospital that's producing, say, emissions of, of uh, large concentrations of cytotoxic drugs, uh, antibiotics, um, I, I, my, I suspect it would be more cost effective to target your treatment at that hospital rather than to target the treatment at the downstream wastewater treatment works just to the, due to the differences in volume of waste that you're going to have to treat. That's my guess, but I've not done, I've not done the... the uh, the, the costings of that. It's something I'd love to do is actually look at a, how you could develop an integrated system uh, and, and sort of assess the costs and benefits of such an integrated system. Okay, thank you. We will go for five more minutes uh, just to make sure we cover most of the questions. Uh, those questions that won't be covered now, you can still send them to email to our speakers and I'm sure they will uh, re respond to you. Um, we will go on with a question for Lorea. Um, someone is uh, thanking you for the documents on the chemicals uh, convention. Uh, do these documents have a checklist that can be used specifically for hospitals? And in addition, how can they get specific training materials and slides that support these documents? Um, the the um, checklist would be applicable to many things that a health um, program, including a hospital, uh, may need. It was a bit designed with uh, UN procurement in mind, um, but definitely I think it could be applicable. Um, and if they wanted to, to take a look at the tool and, and the guidance document um, that relates to it, I would recommend them to just drop me an email um, and then we can, we can take a look through it. Um, there's also um, on our website you could find um, a, a, a document um, explaining a little bit more, well, quite a bit more detail than I was able to give um, just now on, on that tool. Okay, and we have two questions um, that we are not sure to which speaker they were addressed. So I will ask them and whether Alistair and or Lorea can reply to those. So, an attendee is saying that we understand the impact of pharmaceuticals waste on the environment directly. However, what about in, uh, indirectly to their used packaging? Is this also considered to be a risk, such as residue? Um, I, I think from the perspective of packaging generally, um, it is something that um, UNDP is working on. Um, there's actually a project um, within the UNDP procurement unit in Copenhagen that supports the Global Fund um, looking at um, alternative ways to package the medicine both more uh, densely to reduce uh, logistics um, carbon footprint, um, but also to, to reduce the actual packaging material. Um, but maybe Alistair would be better um, equipped to talk about the residue on the packaging. Yeah, it's um, something I don't know a great deal about. But uh, um, in, in the trials that we've done with Pyrocure, um, I mean, that's, that's one thing that we simulated. So we worked with different types of packaging uh, and fed that into the machine with the active ingredients. To check that it that it works. So the idea was that you know, you'd have all all the waste packaging. You'd have the uh, the unused medicines. They would go into the machine, uh, and uh, you know, the, the the material would be destroyed. And actually, it, you know, it, just, it pretty much destroys the packaging as well. Um, and actually, on that point, I'm mean, going back to the, the previous question that was about the uh, uh, the costs. Um, I forgot to mention that actually they have done a cost um, benefit analysis of the Pyrocure system. Um, and, and PyroPure uh, estimate that if, if you used a system like that, 
um, in a pharmacy or in a clinic uh, probably will provide about a 70% cost saving uh, compared to uh, the current way of dealing with uh, hazardous waste in clinics and hospitals and pharmacies. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, also for us, uh, uh, you said that mostly potential impacts have been identified in the lab, but we are unsure if they are happening in the environment. How can we secure that link? Yeah, and that's that's a I mean that's quite a difficult question to answer. So um, I, I would say you know most most of the work that that, that you know, has been done on pharmaceuticals in the environment um, has been done in the laboratory because. Um, you know that's the only way that you can expose an organism to a known amount of the chemical uh, without all the other interferences. Um, there is a little bit of work going on now to sort of try and begin to move that into the real world. So I think uh, I mentioned Thomas Broden's work. I think he's now doing work uh, in more natural systems. Um, there's also been work done on uh, ethanol style, for example, in lakes in Canada, which is moving more into the, the more natural environment. But making the link between the laboratory and the field is, is very, very difficult. Um, and and it's, it's one of the big challenges we have in, in ecotoxicology. Um, and it's something that, you know, we're all trying to, to, to sort of address. Um, and at the moment, I, I don't think we can really do it properly. Okay, thank you. Um, there is just one comment. Uh, an attendee uh, wants to let us know of the EU South Baltic project ca called Morpheus, Model Areas for Removal of Pharmaceutical Substances in the South Baltic. Uh, he says that the project will combine information of upstream pharmaceuticals consumption patterns with estimate of the downstream discharge of pharmaceuticals from selected wastewater treatment plants in coastal regions in Sweden, Germany, Poland, and Lithuania. Um, this can also be followed on Twitter at Morpheus uh, underscore EU. Uh, with this, uh, I want to apologize for the delay, and I would like to thank the speakers for their great work and input today. I also want to thank the Healthcare Without Harm team for uh, the support they gave me today. Uh, I want to thank all of you for choosing to join us. I look forward to continuing the conversation on pharmaceutical pollution in our future events. Don't forget to follow us on noharmeurope.org. I wish you a nice day and goodbye everyone.